All right, Sister Lubaba, all yours. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, we start, as always, with in the name of Allah. Um, Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulihi al-kareem. We start in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most beneficent, and we send all of our prayers of peace upon his noble prophet, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My name is Lubaba Abdullah, and I have the pleasure of being your moderator for today's um, virtual workshop. I am um, an attorney by profession, and I am a mother of two um, beautiful children who are in middle school and elementary. They have just started virtual learning a week ago. And so as you can all imagine, it's been so much fun, like you would not believe. Um, I moved on to Houston about a year ago. Um, and this event is brought to you today by the Risala Foundation. Risala Foundation is Houston's only organization dedicated to Muslim issues, focused on the arts, education, and inspiration. Risala provides a forum for the foremost thinkers in the Muslim world to come to Houston and share their ideas. We aim to provide greater understanding and unity among all Muslim organizations by offering different perspectives from across the beautiful spectrum of our faith. We encourage you to go to our website, www.risala.org, or to visit our Facebook page. We would like to also take a minute to introduce our gracious co-host for the evening, um, Ilm Academy in the Muhammad Webb Foundation. Ilm Academy is a full-time Islamic school in Houston, Texas. That's actually the school that my kids go to. It promotes academic excellence and Islamic values in a nurturing environment that empowers students to reach their highest academic potential while preparing them to become leaders in the service of their families, their communities, and God. Um, the Muhammad Webb Foundation offers young Muslim families across the Chicagoland area an inclusive space for exploring their faith and identity together. Established in 2004, the Muhammad Webb Foundation is a family-led initiative that attracts people from diverse backgrounds, including multiracial and multi-faith families. Muhammad Webb Foundation invites you to partake in a community needs survey related to the pandemic. For more information, please visit their website at muhammadweb, M-O-H-A-M-M-E-D-W-E-B-B.org or, or their Facebook page. Um, before we get started, I know you all have your cell phones really close to you, and so we want to make sure that we can stay in touch with you. So stay connected with us by learning about future events. Take out your phone and text the keyword Risala, R-I-S-A-L-A, to 32222. Please take a moment and do this now. I'll give you like 10 seconds to do this. So you're going to text Risala, R-I-S-A-L-A, to 33. Two, two, two. Okay, so today's lecture is entitled um, Pandemic Parenting, Best Practices Based on Emerging Evidence. And as a parent who um, has not been counting but has been home for six months with her children, I am definitely in need of advice and learning about what the best practices are, especially since we don't see any end in sight anytime soon. I know for us, we are um, doing online schooling at least through the middle of October. And again, there's a really good chance, depending on how things go, that it will be even longer. And so we as a society are not used to being home with our kids while we're managing working as well as online schooling, as well as you know, everything else that needs to get done. Um, and so it's really important for us to learn from these, um, from th these scholars, people who, who study this and who um, can give us best practices on how to deal with this, how to deal with the stress of always being together, of setting boundaries, of setting expectations um, all across age groups. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and introduce our first speaker, who is Ustada Husay Mujaddidi. Um, Ustada Husay is a, um, she will give a 10 minute introduction and then we will um, introduce Dr. Leonard Sachs and he will um, be preparing a, present, a presentation that he's prepared for us. 
Ustada Hussain Mujadidi is a teacher, a spiritual counselor, a mentor, and a mental health advocate who has been working with the Muslim community for over 20 years. Hussain focuses on creating spaces for strong sisterhood of Muslim women through leading halaqas, support groups, and offering spiritual counseling and mentoring, as well as couples spiritual therapy. For the last 10 years, Mujaddidi has been working with Dr. Nafisa Sekandari, a clinical psychologist, to provide both spiritual and a clinical voice on mental health issues. She operates their website, which is www.mentalhealth for the number four muslims.com with Sekandari. They have expanded by working with authors in the field of mental and spiritual health and by creating a directory of Muslim therapists. Mujaddidi co hosts an online radio program called Insights, a Muslim woman unscripted on One Legacy Radio and teaches classes for women at Ta'lif. She regularly offers workshops and other talks to Islamic schools and mosques. With that, Ustada Husay, are you with us? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I will pass it on to you. Thank you so much. Jazakumullah khairan. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal-mursaleen. Sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much, Sister Lubaba and all of the organizers at uh, Risala Foundation, excuse me, for uh, putting this program together. I was actually reminiscing earlier today about my one of my last trips to Houston, where I was, I believe, speaking at a Risala Foundation event. And um, SubhanAllah, it was just such a memorable event for many reasons. Everybody I met was so gracious, so warm, so welcoming uh, throughout the city of Houston, actually, from the airport, the entire experience. Um, and uh, it was memorable, again, for multiple reasons. I was a new, I had just had my second son, so I had a newborn. And I don't know what possessed me to do it, but I did it. I flew from San Francisco to Houston uh, and then returned the same day. So it was a very long day, but it was well worth it. And I'm always honored to uh, to be involved in any project with the Risala Foundation. So I think again, the organizers in particular, Brother Zain, Brother Rehan, Sister Hannah, Sister Lubaba, all of the people behind this program. And of course, uh, all of you for being here with us. You know, there's many programs happening now online. So it's always an honor uh, to, to have uh, you with us. Um, now, I know I'm very excited. I'm actually uh, so excited because I absolutely, like most of the people I know attending or watching right, right now, love Dr. Sachs. I mean, Dr. Sachs, you've impacted me personally through my journey as a parent. I have your books. I've uh, benefited so much from the wisdoms that you've shared. I've actually met you uh, briefly, I believe, maybe a few years ago here in the Bay Area when you came to speak at North Star School. I have, um, so I've listened to you in person. I've followed you on social media. You've just been so impactful for myself and so many uh, people in the world. I'm, I'm certain of that uh, as your uh, the the what, the uh, amazing reception of your your books tell so many people have them people are always commenting or, or sourcing from them so thank you for all that you've done I want to listen to you so I'm going to try to keep my remarks as brief as possible so we can jump in and, and hear your presentation but I was asked to share a few thoughts on Islamic parenting uh, or parenting from the Islamic perspective and one of the hadith that I use whenever I do any parenting talks is actually pretty well known, uh, but uh, it's uh, it's one that I'll just use a fragment of it because it's pretty lengthy, but the very first phrase is actually in and of itself. So such a powerful uh, analogy. And it is, which means it translates to uh, each of you is a shepherd or every one of you is a shepherd and is responsible for his or her flock. Now, again, it's a lengthier hadith, but this statement independently, it's, it tells us so much. It's such a great analogy for parenting, and it really does give us um, a lot about the objectives and the aims of parenting in Islam. For example, from the very first line, we understand that parenting is seen as it's a call to action, right? That we, it's a trust and a responsibility, which we will be held accountable for. So right away, it's established that this is a responsibility, it's a task, it's something that you have to take seriously. Uh, we can also extrapolate from it that every one of us is going to experience two things in our life, right? We're first uh, going to be a part of that flock, right? Which is evident, it's childhood, right? Going through the experience of being part of that flock. And then eventually we're expected to become leaders, to become, to fulfill the role of, of being a shepherd, uh, which is of course adulthood. 
So this is just the natural course uh, of life where childhood is seen as an age of innocence and free spiritedness. And adulthood is the age of responsibility and leadership. So that's also uh, elucidates that for us, just this one statement. And then, you know, the, to, to dig deeper, when we understand that being part of what, what is being part of a flock, what does that entail? Well, it tells us that we must be cared for right that uh, because obviously uh, animals or anything that's part of a flock right they're domesticated they need to be looked after they they're not wild so you have to t take care of them again it's clarifying the relationship for the the one who's responsible for them that you are responsible to feed them to look after them to guide them to nurse them when they're not well to protect them from harm um, and to eventually lead let them be become more independent of you eventually that is the role of, of, uh, of a shepherd, right, towards their flock. And those are the rights of the flock. So when we, again, compare it to children, these would be the rights of the children in Islam for all of those things to happen. So it's not enough just to, for, uh, for, from the perspective of the shepherd, to do those things, but you actually have to do them well. And not according to your own standards, but to the standards of God, because he's holding you accountable. When he tells us that we're, res we're responsible, we're not responsible to ourselves, we're responsible to God. And so that, again, just really makes it very clear that this is there's a structure and a way of parenting that we have to abide by. We can't just uh, sort of wing it or come up with our own uh, ideas on this. This is a, 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 an immense responsibility. And again, we're held accountable to God. But from that one line, you know, already we've learned so much, but there's even more. Uh, because if, again, we elaborate further, I'd like to, you know, use this analogy of a shepherd and ask all of you to just take a minute, just a few seconds, and imagine what you think of when you think of the word shepherd, right? Let your imagination sort of play out. Um, it could be a male or female, obviously, but what do, what are they, how are they dressed? What, what is their, you know, how do, how are they standing? Um, what is, what are their surroundings like? Um, what, what do you imagine if, when you imagine a shepherd? Um, and just, you know, let that play out for just a few seconds. But obviously, because we're all different and maybe we have experiences, some people may have actually lived in, in, in situations or places where they um, had, you know, they knew people in this uh, who, who were shepherds or who had, you know, maybe they lived on a farm or they had relatives on a farm. My husband, for example, he comes from a family of farmers. So this is very, he, he grew up like this, but other people might not have that experience. But regardless, there are certain universal concepts when we think of someone shepherding that we all sort of understand, right? For example, we know that a shepherd has to be an early riser, right? He can't or she can't afford to sleep in and, and you know, let that alarm clock snooze because the animals depend on the shepherd, you know? So we the, the shepherd has to be ahead, right? They have to always be thinking ahead, being proactive, right? Uh, waking up at the crack of dawn, getting everything ready for the animals. Again, the, the flock is dependent on the shepherd. So that's right away establishing that this is, uh, you know, you an immense responsibility, but at the very start of your every day, you have to be ahead. Shepherds also, if you um, are aware of ever seen any images of a shepherd, even some of the biblical images that are out there, you'll remember that there's they're always holding a staff, right? And the staff is the long stick that uh, has a, a hook at the end of it, which we which is called a crook. Now that staff is not just a walking stick; it's actually multifunctional. And it's really interesting to think, consider what that staff, uh, what the purpose of that staff, because there's many purposes. First, you know, you 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 uh, test the terrain, right? Before you take your flock somewhere, you want to make sure you're testing the waters, testing the ground, because you don't want them to stumble and fall and injure themselves. So that is again the responsibility of the shepherd to make sure that they create that safety before they just take before they take their flock out to the pastures, right? So you're testing the terrain, but you also use that staff as for reach you know when you're trying to corral hundreds of animals there's a communication that has to happen between the shepherd and the flock sometimes they might use sounds or other objects or instruments but they also communicate with the staff so when they're extending that staff out it is a form of communication by telling the animals where the boundary is right they're corralling so there's that communication that's happening 
And then they also use the crook, that hooked part of the staff, to help the, uh, the flock when they do stumble or if they get tangled up in something. They might pull them from the ankle or from the neck or whichever part that, that is stuck. But it's a very useful tool. So think of tools, right? Shepherd is always equipped with the right tools. And in addition to that staff, they also have a rod. And that rod is like a club-like device, and that is used to ward off dangerous predators or threats. But of course, the shepherd is looking out for those threats. So he's, he or she is always vigilant, always prepared, always making sure that the, the gate is secured and that they know what to look for when it comes to what the threats are. So again, in summary, you know, this is so in line with, with Islamic parenting. Uh, the concept of being proactive, right? Ahead of his or her flock, having our priorities straight, time management, all of these things that we as Muslims should have. And, you know, Dr. Sachs in his book, he says, the key to healthy child development is to do the right thing at the right time. I love that. That is a gem because that is exactly how we should understand our role in every capacity. The timing is, is, uh, is so important, but especially when it comes to our parenting philosophy. And then also to be able to reach our flock. What does that mean? To be able to communicate effectively, right? We have to communicate effectively. The flock cannot, they, they, they're looking to us for guidance. So again, Dr. Sachs says in his book, you have to correct, to redirect, to point out shortcomings. I love that. Another amazing gem that's so simple to remember when it comes to your parenting philosophy. And then you have to know how to protect your flock, right, from going astray, because they do. If, they, if you don't have the boundaries that are clear for them, the flock will go astray. And if you're not vigilant from predators and dangers, then they'll get eaten and taken away. So we as parents have to constantly know and be active and vigilant and all of that. But this is so in line. And that's why it's such a perfect analogy uh, for, uh, for, for us as Muslims to, to remember what our parenting philosophy should be. But again, there's even more. When we think of you know, this concept of being uh, ahead, to be effective, right? As parents or in any capacity, the early riser, the you know, the early bird gets the worm. I teach my kids this all the time that try to really be ahead of things, think, read ahead, seek knowledge, but be proactive. Don't uh, be a passive parent because the most dangerous type of a parent is the passive one, the one that just thinks things are going to happen by chance. You know, th that's not how it works. You have to work at it. It is a struggle. We know that, but we also look to the prophet's. Uh, for our example, because parenting, he's taught us that parenting is that trust and it's a, a two-way you know, relationship. There's, we have to, as, uh, as responsible parents, know first and foremost what our responsibilities are right before we start to demand our rights. And unfortunately in our day and age, a lot of people have that inverted where they think of parenting or the family structure you know, children as basically indentured servants, you know, for about 18 years, I get to just tell them what to do. They're at my beck and call. That's what they think of children. This is not the, the model of parenting that the Prophet left for us. He reminds us in his own example and through many of his teachings to be gentle, to be always concerned about the other, to put the needs of the other before uh, yourself. This is his practice, his way. And he also was never harsh. You can't find a single uh, tradition of anybody, any of the children that he, any of his own children or any of the children that were around him. There were many children and youth that were around him. All of them would, uh, by consensus, would, would declare that he was so gentle. He never said no to people. He was just had a very gentle disposition. And he, of course, taught us, alayka birrifq, right? You must be gentle. Verily, gentleness is not in anything except that it beautifies it, and it is not removed from anything except that it disgraces it. These are his words. So when we, again, think about you know, being effective or being ahead and being proactive, we're talking about all of this, knowing this with certainty. And then the communication skills, so important to understand emotional intelligence. And if you read any of Dr. Sachs's books, that is essentially what he is really trying to teach us. He's teaching us to be more effective communicators, to have clear language and the way we, the, we communicate to, you know, to, to just have boundaries that are clear and not to be afraid to, you know, to, to, 
to uh, to uh, to speak our 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 truths, right? Because sometimes there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of uh, second guessing that happens when it comes to parenting. So he's very empowering in that way. But this is again very much in line with the message of Islam when it comes to parenting to be effective communicators. And we again look to the Prophet I said, I'm so emotionally intelligent, the most emotionally intelligent person according to us. Uh, you know, in terms of his empathy, he was able to communicate with people of all backgrounds and ages. It didn't matter. And he embodied every, all the virtues that we all aspire to uh, effortlessly. He had that with all of his relationships. And then of course, being vigilant, looking out for threats. This is another part of our faith that is very concrete. We have to always be uh, you know, prepared um, uh, spiritually, inwardly, we're prepared for tribulation, catastrophes, you know, there, things, life happens. It's not going to be, always be easy. And our, uh, in, in, in the sacred text, this is repeated over and over that this life is a test, hardships will come, but we have to do the inward work of preparing for that, but also when it comes to parenting, be absolutely vigilant. There are threats, uh, you know, we, we have this concept of, you know, the inward demons. So that we have internal threats that we all struggle with and we will struggle with, but then there's external demons as well. We do believe in that. We have that concept that there are people and, and forces of evil that are out there. And we have to, as parents, that's our responsibility to protect our flock, to make sure that they are safe from harm. So all of this, again, repeated so much throughout our uh, scriptures and our texts texts uh, regarding parenting and regarding just in general being vigilant and present and mindful people being aware and taking life seriously that's the other uh, thing I really appreciate about Dr. Sachs's um, content is he's always reinforcing that idea of just being you know serious and having priorities so when he talks for example and and I'll end here because I know I'm going over time but one of my absolutely favorite quotes from uh, Collapse of Parenting which I have right in front of me if you don't have it you should all have this book uh, in addition to all his other books but in this book he says all of us as parents need to establish the primacy of the parent-child relationship over peer-to-peer -peer relationships over academics and over other activities I love this quote and it's so relevant today to this concept of pandemic parenting because so many parents are struggling. I personally heard of a lot of parents who've been struggling for the past few months because you know, if you think about it, we are in these situations that are really unprecedented. So much time we're spending in close quarters with one another. I actually did a quick search the other day just to figure out how many hours we've been in quarantine because you know the months and days are passing but I wanted to know hours we're looking at 3,050 hours that we've been sharing a lot of space with uh, you know our, our hopefully our, our loved ones and people that we like to be around but you know there are some people who are really really struggling with being in such close proximity with one another and then the schedule and the school and, and the work and I get it I, I hear it all the time but I think what I appreciate about Dr. Sachs's advice throughout all of his uh amazing uh, uh, you know content is that he want he's empowering parents to make sure that when you're looking at your child and they're struggling with oh you know whining about why you know I want to go back to school and I, I want to be with my friends and they're not happy spending time maybe with the family that you have to you know reconnect reset and make sure that establishing that that primacy which he says right about the, the your relationship with them first and foremost but also their elders their extended family members I love that there's so much amazing again content that aligns with our belief about the priority of family over all of these other distractions and things that will come and go and they'll see it. We all saw it. You know, we had friends that were in, uh, in high school, we were connected with and then we know we, we lost complete touch with them. We, maybe we were inseparable then and now we don't know anything about them, but family remains. And so this, con you know, when we're talking about the struggles of pandemic parenting, I think from, and from my perspective, this advice is really what we should all follow because regardless if we're all Wherever we are, you know, maybe some of us are enjoying this time with our families, maybe some of us aren't. But if that's the takeaway from all of this, that we have reset and we have actually established the primacy of the family bond, then we're successful. And that's uh, hopefully that should bring some comfort to all of us. Uh, but inshallah, I'll end it there. I had more, but I know I'm going over and I'm excited to hear from Dr. Sachs. So thank you so much for your time. And I'll be here uh, listening and then we'll join you at the end for the Q&A. Assalamu alaikum. Wow. Well, I really want to thank Hosai for those kind words. Uh, and uh, I'm going to, as you'll see, I'm going to uh, really pick up where Hosai has left off. Uh, but I, again, I want to thank Hosai and I want to thank Rehan for uh, inviting me back. I had the privilege of speaking a few 
uh, years back, uh, along with Imam Tahir Anwar uh, at the Risala Foundation in Sugarland, Texas. Uh, so anyhow, I'm going to talk for about uh, 80, 90 minutes, and then I am going to stay on for your questions and uh, uh, do my best to answer them along with the other panelists. A quick word about my background. Hosai was very, very gracious and courteous. I earned my undergraduate degree at MIT. I earned my doctorate in psychology and my medical degree at the University of Pennsylvania. I am a practicing physician. Started visiting schools uh, 19 years ago. I've now visited and spoken more than 460 schools over the last 19 years. But I think it's also relevant that I'm medical director of an urgent care facility here in Chester County, Pennsylvania, about 45 minutes west of Philadelphia, uh, where we have diagnosed over 120 cases of coronavirus in our facility as of two days ago. Uh, as Josiah mentioned, I've written four books, uh, Why Gender Matters, Boys Adrift, uh, Girls on the Edge, that's the new edition, comes out in four days, uh, and The Collapse of Parenting. I've prepared a handout for you. I'm going to be uh, sharing a lot of data with you and showing you a lot of uh, research. Uh, all the links, all the numbers, uh, uh, all the studies that I'm going to cite, you will find them all in your handout. I will show you this link again. You don't need it now. Don't pull it up now. It's just a distraction. Stay with me on the Zoom. I'll show you this link again, but I just want you to be aware you don't need to be scribbling down numbers and links. Uh, they're all in the 12 page handout and I will show you this link again uh, throughout the presentation. So I wanna begin with some data from the CDC. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control has been monitoring anxiety and depression among Americans for many years, typically twice a year with uh, at least 70,000 or 80,000 uh, individuals in each cycle. Uh, in April of this year, they said, hey, we got a pandemic going on now. Let's step up the monitoring frequency. Uh, instead of doing this every six months, let's start doing it every week. Let's start surveying 70, 80,000 Americans every week to see what's going on. Uh, adults age 18 to over 80 years of age, and they also published a baseline so that we have something to compare to. And the baseline was from a year before uh, they began doing this. So April 2019, last year, in April 2019, just over 8% of American adults reported uh, significant impairment due to anxiety. And this is a validated questionnaire that they use. Uh, in the most recent and final uh, iteration of that questionnaire, July 21st of this year, over 36% of American adults reported significant impairment due to anxiety, having trouble concentrating, having trouble focusing, having trouble getting to sleep or staying asleep. Uh, so that last uh, round of, question, of the questionnaire, uh, July 21st, they, they break it down by age. And as you can see, and these numbers are all in your handout, the younger you are, the more likely you are to be reporting significant uh, impairment due to anxiety. More than 46% among the youngest adults, only 13% among the oldest adults. And other research from Gene Twenge and others suggests that adolescents, 13 to 17 years old, are experiencing even higher rates of anxiety. Unfortunately, the CDC has discontinued that study. Uh, data from July 21st are the last round that we will get. But I think the message is very clear. Anxiety has risen, it has at least quadrupled uh, among Americans uh, during the pandemic. And the younger you are, the greater the risk that you are experiencing anxiety. Why? And what can you do about it as a parent uh, for your child or teenager? That's kind of where I want to start this evening. Why this explosion in anxiety? Well, I think the short answer is uncertainty. Uh, as humans, we don't like to face uh, uncertainty. What's the risk that something bad is going to happen to me? Uh, well, the, nobody knows. Uh, the risk is uncertain. Now, we've got 50-plus years of scholars like uh, Marty Seligman, uh, who was one of my professors at Penn when I was earning my doctorate 40 years ago. Uh, Marty Seligman and his colleagues did all this work on, on learned helplessness and 
uh, showing that risk can be empowering and invigorating if it is controllable, if you have some element of control over that risk. If you do not have control over that risk, if it is uncontrollable, then all kinds of bad things happen. Cortisol level rises, uh, stress hormones rise, and bad things happen. And the trajectory of lived experience in the United States, the older you are, the lower the uncertainty that you are facing. If you're 50 years old, uh, odds are very good that you have a career or a job behind you. You have many years experience in the workplace and you know what your prospects are uh, better than a teenager does, better than a child does. Likewise, if you're 80, even though the actual risk of death is, is greater for an 80 year old than for a 50 year old or for a 20 year old. So I think that's where we need to start with research from the CDC and now from many other sources showing that there has been an explosion in anxiety uh, and that the younger you are, the greater the risk that you are experiencing significant impairment due to anxiety and or depression right now. Now I wanna bring in the research of Joseph uh, James Coleman and his colleagues at uh, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, they went across the United States uh, in the 1960s interviewing high school students and, asked, and conducting structured interviews. And one of the questions they always asked these kids was, if all your friends wanted you to join a particular club, but one of your parents, one of your parents did not approve, would you still join? And 50 years ago, the great majority of American teens told Professor Coleman, no, they would not join. Even if all their friends wanted them to join, they would not join if one of their parents did not approve. Because in that era, kids valued the opinion of their parents above the combined opinion of all their peers. I posed an updated version of Professor Coleman's question to kids across the United States between 2011 and 2019. I asked kids in Texas and across the United States, I asked them, if all your friends wanted you to sign up for a particular social media site, would you consult your parents first? And the most common answer I got from American kids, middle school kids, high school kids, most common answer I get was not yes or no, it's laughter. They burst out laughing. As one girl said to me, she said, my parents would probably think TikTok is some kind of grandfather clock. You know, why would I ask them? Now these kids may say they love their parents and maybe they do but they care more about what their same age peers think than what their parents think. And that's really important. It's important because most cultures have been characterized by strong attachments across generations. But many scholars have now found that in the United States, teens' primary attachment is to their same age, age peers. That's a fancy way of saying that they, they care desperately what their same age peers think. They care more about what their same age peers think than they care what their parents think. And that is a robust finding. And that is true whether this kid is atheist, Christian, Jewish, or Muslim. Uh, and we have good data on that point, specifically looking at religious affiliation. Uh, having a strong religious affiliation does not automatically protect you. And this is so important because good parents offer unconditional attachment, but teens don't. Good parents nurture, but teens generally can't. Good parents sacrifice for their kids without expecting anything in return, but teens rarely do so for their same age friends. So that's my daughter, Sarah, 14 years old. Suppose she were to say to me, I hate you. I'm never going to talk to you ever again as long as I live. She never said that, but let's imagine that she did. Well, her mother and I would discuss and decide what privileges she would lose and for how long as a result of that outburst. But nothing fundamental would change. She would not lose her place in our home. We would not stop loving her. There's nothing she could do or say that would cause us to stop loving her. And she knows that. And we are her primary attachment. 
And so she can relax because she knows that no matter what, we will always love her. That foundation will never be shaken. But suppose she says those same words to a friend at school. I hate you. I never want to talk to you ever again as long as I live. Well, that friendship is over or it is at least badly damaged. Pure relations are contingent and ephemeral. They can change overnight and every kid knows it. You want to see an American teenage girl have a total meltdown? I'll tell you how to do it. It's very simple. Take her phone away from her without warning and she will totally freak out. She'll be like, Vanessa doesn't know I don't have my phone. What happens if she texts me and I don't answer? She's going to think I'm ignoring her. She's going to think I don't like her. You can go from being the most popular girl to being the odd girl out in one day, in five minutes, and every girl knows it. So they're all glued to their phones, looking at their phones. So I have spoken at schools not only at the United States, across the United States, but around the world. And I have, on two occasions, visited MLC, a, a, a independent school in Perth in Western Australia. And I was talking to a teacher there who's been there for, gosh, it must be nearly 30 years. And she told me that for the first 20 years or so, you know, she would have her lunch out on the beautiful lawn, uh, beautiful green lawn extending from the front door of the school down to the Indian Ocean. It's a stunning view facing west. And she would sit on the lawn and, and she told me how once a girl came and confided in her. And this girl told her, this girl and confided in the teacher, told the teacher that she's worried that her boyfriend is making eyes at this other girl. And, oh no, what am I going to do? I think he's, he's getting ready to dump me. And the teacher told this girl, she said, don't worry about that boy. He's a 15-year-old boy, 15-year-old boy boys are not fully human. You know, he, he doesn't deserve you. He's very immature. Don't worry about what he thinks. That's a very useful perspective. Look, what is required in order to be a good counselor? A good counselor, you don't necessarily have to have a degree, but you do have to have a different perspective. A good counselor must be able to offer the client a different perspective from a different background. And this teacher, she's not a counselor, she's a classroom teacher, but she is well qualified to counsel this girl and give her a different perspective. Don't worry about what that boy thinks, it's not that important. Very useful advice. But this teacher told me that girls don't ask her anymore. And it's not just this teacher at this school, this is a robust phenomenon across certainly the English speaking world. United States, Canada, Australia, United Kingdom, et cetera. Kids aren't talking to grownups anymore. They're talking to other peers. So now imagine a girl in the same situation, her boyfriend's making eyes at another girl, but she's not asking an adult woman anymore. She's asking another girl her own age. Now, Melissa may have a heart of cold, maybe the nicest girl ever, but she is unqualified to counsel her friend. Because remember, what are the first requirements for a good counselor? Different experience, different perspective. Melissa doesn't have that. They're both at the same school. They both think this boy is, is cool. They both care what he thinks. And so Emily confides in her same age friend. Hey, I think Jason's making eyes at this other girl. And Melissa's like, OMG, because they're texting. I saw him at the party with that other girl and they went in this room and when they came out, their clothes were all messed up. And Emily's like, oh my gosh, it's true. He's totally gonna dump me. These kids don't realize that talking with the same age peer is not making it better. It's making it worse. They are spiraling into a positive feedback loop, becoming more and more anxious and they have no insight, no awareness that talking about it isn't making it better, it's making it worse. Psychologists have coined a term, and that term is co-rumination. That term did not exist in psychology 20 years ago. It's a term psychologists have coined recently to describe what they are seeing as 
American teens no longer confide in grownups. They confide in same age peers. And as a result, they're making each other more and more anxious. And researchers have found that social media and the cell phone are driving co-rumination. Now let's bring this into the pandemic. We have lots of evidence showing that teens are spending much more time online since the coronavirus hit. They're not allowed to go party at the beach or hang out with 50 other teens at a, at a party. Uh, they're online. They're spending more time online. And one teen says, hey, I hear no sports this fall. All sports are canceled because of the pandemic. Well, no sports means no scouts. Another teen says no scouts means no Division I scholarships, no D1 scholarships. And now another teen is totally frantic because he was counting on a, on a D1 scholarship to go to college, and now all the teens are saying, hey, it's not going to happen. Now, if a grown-up were in part of this conversation, the grown-up could say, could offer a different perspective and tone things down. But toning things down is not what teens really excel at. Oh, rumination. So, as you know, I'm a family doctor. I'm seeing kids every day. And I can tell you within two minutes max, when I encounter a child or teen, I, can, I know whether that kid's primary attachment is to their parents or to same age peers. I'm in Pennsylvania. That's the United States. Most kids in the United States Regardless of religious affiliation, it is well established now that for most kids, the majority of kids in the United States, their primary attachment is the same age peers. But I will occasionally find a kid whose primary attachment is to their parents. And I can tell right away because that, that kid whose primary attachment is their parents, they're smiling, they're making good eye contact, they're engaging, they can, they're articulate. But that's unusual. What I see much more often is the teenager who is sullen, withdrawn, resentful. Because that teen's primary attachment is the same age peers. But now because of the coronavirus, they're not allowed to hang with their peers in, in large groups. Uh, they're not allowed to go to Galveston and, and hang out at the beach. Uh, and they're upset because they feel like, hey, this is my life and you're taking my life away from me. And they're happy if they can be online with their, with their peers, but the moment you try to limit that and turn off the device, they get really upset. They're only happy when they're online with their peers, with their peers. So I do think we have enough evidence from, from uh, reliable sources to begin to create some evidence-based recommendations and these are all in your handout. Prioritize. Cancel the play date. Make a family date instead. Limit how much time your kid is spending on social media or on video games with other kids. And I'm going to uh, give some very specific guidelines regarding social media and video games in just a few minutes. Ask open-ended questions. You want to restore that line of communication that was the norm for American parents a generation ago that is now the exception. You want to say, hey, what's on your mind? Talk to me. You can talk to me. You can confide in me. And remind your child or your teen, I will always be here for you. That foundation will never be shaken, no matter what happens. Offer a grown-up perspective. Yeah, this is really a bummer and a tremendous disappointment on, in many domains. Uh, athletes are not able to do their sports, not able to go back to school. Uh, yeah, this is a tremendous disappointment, but you're not dying and you are unlikely to die. If your child or teenager does not have a major underlying condition like cancer, it is very unlikely that your child or teen is going to die from the virus. Yeah, I've, I've read the stories. They're extremely rare. The, the reality is that a child or teen without a major underlying condition like cancer is, is 
vanishingly unlikely to die from the coronavirus. You don't have cancer. You're, you're not homeless. You're inconvenienced. Offer that different perspective because their same age peers is very likely the same age peers are freaking out. They don't need that from you. You have to be that solid foundation. So I want to go in a little bit different direction. Um, as you know, I visited schools uh, around the world, and German is my one language, uh, in which I am fluent besides English. And so I have had the privilege of visiting schools across Germany and German-speaking Switzerland, and I have visited Waldkindergarten. So a Waldkindergarten, forest kindergarten, outdoor kindergarten, that means no building, no classroom. Everything is outdoors every day, all year round. Uh, so that's a real saw. Uh, that would be very unusual to find in American kindergarten, a kid sawing a branch outdoors without a grown-up around. So uh, one year ago this month, I visited a, a Wald kindergarten in Oberammergau in uh, southern Bavaria. And this boy and the other kids that's are awesome. using a sharp knife to uh, cut branches that they found. And now his friend is uh, sitting down and she's getting out her sharp knife. Uh, it would be most unusual in the United States to find a kindergarten where four-year-olds and five-year-olds are using sharp knives to whittle branches with no grown-up around. It is common. Uh, not just uh, in Waldkindergarten, but indeed across Germany and German-speaking Switzerland. Uh, it is uh, quite rare in the United States. And I also have pictures of kids at the Waldkindergarten climbing tall trees with no net, with no grown-up, with no special flooring. It's the Bavarian forest. Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt have written about what they call the culture of safetyism which they find is now pervasive across the United States. By the culture of safetyism, they mean the belief that if any kid might get hurt, then no child can participate. Don't do that, you might get hurt. And so many articles supporting this of, ki of kindergartens that have been required to take down their treehouse, get rid of that log, it's a splinter hazard. Uh, don't do that. You might get hit, hurt. If any kid might get hurt, then no child can participate. And the result, as many scholars have now found, is kids who are risk averse and parents and teachers who are risk averse. A child who has had a childhood climbing trees and whittling wood with sharp knives has learned, yeah, I might get hurt, but I can handle that. I am not afraid. One of the photographs of my daughter that I'm most proud of is after she, she was climbing at the top of a very tall jungle gym about nine foot up and fell on her outstretched hand from nine feet and broke her wrist. And I casted her. And I have a photograph of her proudly showing off her uh, magenta pink cast that I applied. She has learned, yeah, I might get hurt, but I can handle that. I'm not afraid. Uh, researchers in Europe have found that when kids have these experiences, they experience antiphobic benefits. The citation is in your handout. These kids are less likely to be afraid, more courageous, more willing to go out and take risks. That's what you want your child to learn. Uh, you know, if your child gets through elementary school without ever having skinned a knee or sprained an ankle, their childhood is seriously deficient. But the American kid, you know, and I will see in, in as a family doctor, I will see parents come in angry because their kid was running around on the play playground and, and tripped and, and sprained their ankle. And the parents are angry. They're like, that playground shouldn't have had that stick there that my kid tripped on. And I said, tripping and falling is part of childhood. Spraining your ankle is part of childhood. Your kid's gonna be fine. This is an experience they need to have. 
And if they don't have it, if they have a bubble wrap childhood and never sprain their ankle and never scrape their knee because they've been told, don't do that, you might get afraid, you might get hurt. They're learning to be afraid. They're learning to view the world as a dangerous stay place. Just stay, stay home in your bedroom and play video games. That's what these authors mean by safetyism. If any kid might get hurt, then no child should participate. As you know, I work as a family doctor. I've seen a great many cases of the coronavirus firsthand. But I'll share something personal with you. I'm 60 years old. I'm fat. I have high blood pressure. That's four major risk factors. Age over 50, male rather than female, overweight, high blood pressure, four major risk factors for having a bad outcome if I should get sick. I haven't gotten sick, but if I do, I'm at very high risk. But I go to work. I'll be back in the office tomorrow seeing sick patients. I wear a mask. I wear gloves. I wash my hands after every patient. Uh, here in southeastern Pennsylvania, we are not a hot spot. And in uh, compliance with our local guidelines, my daughter's school will be open in 12 days, and she will return to the classroom. And I have spoken with the school leadership, and I support that decision. Uh, Timeline is a little bit different in Houston. I copied this. Uh, this is a screenshot from the Houston ISD. Uh, they will not begin face-to-face -face instruction until October 19th at the earliest. And I'm hearing from some parents who say, if there is any possibility that my kid might catch the virus at school, then my kid isn't going to school. Look, life is about judging risk and benefit, balancing risk and benefit. If you insist on saying, hey, nothing less than 100% safety is satisfactory, if there is a one chance in a thousand that my kid's going to get the coronavirus, then they're not going to school. Don't do that. You might get sick. Don't do that. Don't teach your kid to be afraid. Don't teach your kid to be risk averse. Teach courage. Courage means, courage doesn't mean that you ignore the risk. I am not ignoring the risk of the coronavirus. I am a practicing physician. I am in the trenches. I see this firsthand. You prepare for the risk and you move forward. Don't teach your kid to be frightened. Be the role model. You, the parent, are the first teacher of good behavior and of virtue. And that includes the virtue of courage. So I mentioned earlier that you must limit social media and video games. I now want to present some evidence to provide some guidelines based on evidence. And I think it's important for us to remember how quickly all of this has happened. According to Nielsen, more than half of American girls age 12 are now on Instagram. Instagram is less than 10 years old. They'll celebrate their 10th anniversary uh, in October. And it's huge for American uh, children and teens. To understand why that matters and why that matters more for girls than it does for boys, I want you to imagine a girl living in ancient times. By ancient times, I mean 20 years ago. It's the evening. She's writing in her diary, by which I mean she's writing in a bound volume of blank pages with a pen. She's writing about who she likes, who she doesn't like, what she really wants out of life. She might write five pages in the evening. She's not going to show that to anyone. If she's got a younger brother, she'll keep it under lock and key. But she's doing some important work. She's figuring out, what do I really want? What's really important to me? Fast forward to today. Researchers find that American uh, girls no longer keep a diary. 20 years ago, more than half of American girls, more than half of American teen girls were keeping some kind of diary that they were writing in regularly. Today, that figure is down to less than 5%. There's not enough time in the day. She's busy. She's posting a photo on Instagram. And when I speak to middle school kids, high school kids, I'll ask them, what's the difference between writing in a diary 
and posting on Instagram. And the kids raise their hand and I call on them and they always say, a diary is private, Instagram is public. Bingo. Instagram is public. When researchers look at how kids are using Instagram, they don't find any five-page essays about what I really want out of life. They find photos. Lots of photos. That's how kids use Instagram. They post photos. And this is true for boys as well. But the photos are different. A boy and a girl both go to the football game and they both take pictures at the game. But it turns out the boy is taking a picture of the game or the pretty cheerleader at the game. The girl is turning the phone on herself and she's taking 100 selfies at the game. And that night she's going through those 100 selfies and finding two or three where she's laughing and the kids around her are laughing. And that's what she's posting on Instagram. Here I am at the game, what a great time. The difference between writing in a diary and posting on Instagram is the difference between living and performing. Writing in a diary is about your life. It's about figuring out what you want and who you are. Instagram, as used by American children and teens, is a performance. There's nothing wrong with a performance. A performance is a show that you put on to entertain or amuse other people. I don't see anything wrong with that. As long as you understand that the performance has to come to an end and you take off your mask and resume your real life. My concern, listening to American girls, is that many of them are trapped in what I've come to call the cyber bubble of 24 seven texting and social media. And the performance never ends and it is exhausting and it is draining. These girls are hyper-connected to other girls their own age, but disconnected from themselves. Disconnected from themselves. So we now have a great deal of research showing that the more time a teenager spends on social media, that, like Instagram or TikTok, the more likely that teen is to become depressed. From longitudinal cohort study. So here's one of those studies. So in this study, they recruited American teens all of whom were on Instagram and looked to, to see how often and to what extent that team was looking at other kids on Instagram or how many likes they got for their own post on Instagram and the likelihood that that team would become depressed over time. And they found the more time that you are on Instagram, the more likely you are to become depressed. And that was true for boys but it was much more true for girls. It was much bigger effect for girls than it was for boys. And that is a robust finding. Uh, multiple longitudinal cohort studies have now documented that. Namely, that the more time a girl spends on social media, like Instagram or TikTok, the more likely that girl is to become anxious or depressed. It's a small effect for boys. It's a much bigger effect for girls. Why? Well, we can start to, well, why the gender difference? Why girls more than boys? We can start to get a handle on the difference between girls and boys, looking at some work by T Carol Dweck and her colleagues at Stanford, showing that girls are very ready to believe that other girls are having more fun than they are, that other girls' lives are more interesting than their own life is. This turns out to be not at all true for boys. Turns out that boys greatly overestimate how interesting their own life is to other people. And girls use social media differently than boys do. So a boy and a girl both get sick. They both throw up. The boy posts a photo of his own vomit on his Instagram. Girls never do that. Boys post a much wider range of their lived experience, the vomit, the dead dog. Girls post mostly just the fun stuff, the happy stuff. This boy looking at Jake's dead dog or Brett's vomit is unlikely to want to be Jake or Brett. But girls are posting only the fun stuff. So now you understand three mechanisms that drive this sex difference in the effects of social media. First of all, girls are more invested in their posts. If you don't like Jake's photo of the pretty, pretty cheerleader, he doesn't care. But if you don't like Sonia's photo of Sonia, she's going to take that more personally. And girls post five times as many photos as boys do on social media. Girls are posting just a narrow range of their lived experience, the fun stuff, the happy stuff. Boys are posting a much wider range. And boys greatly overestimate how, how interesting their own life is to begin with. So 
these are three mechanisms that help us to understand why girls are more vulnerable to the toxic effects of social media than boys are. Boys are, as we'll see in just a moment, more vulnerable to the addictive properties of video games. We'll get to that in just a second. So what can you do about it? Well, you have to begin by understanding that most 13-year-olds are not masters of time management. In one study, they asked this girl, how much time you were on Instagram last night? She said, uh, 40 minutes. It was actually over two hours. But I don't think she was lying. I think she lost track of time. You must limit how much time your kid is spending on social media. And the good news is there's lots of apps out there that make it very easy to do that. And I've listed them on your handout. And I'll be a look at that list. And I talk about some of the pros and cons of the various social media sites, excuse me, this par the various parental monitoring apps in your handout. We don't really have time for that right now. Uh, but all of them make it very easy to limit. I'm not suggesting that you prohibit. Limit how much time your kid is spending on social media. 20, 30, 40 minutes a day is okay. Two hours a day is too much. And explain to your kid, look, as part of my job as your parent, look, my, my parents insisted on knowing where I was at all times. I have to know where you are at all times, except now it's not out there, it's online. It's part of my job to know what you're doing online. Make sure you're not spending two, three hours a day on social media this app will lock you out. And we now have some very good research, which I cite, and the citation is in your handout. Jean Twege and her colleagues published last year, big data based on tens of thousands of adolescents. So on the x-axis, you have how much time this kid is spending on social media, like Instagram and TikTok. On the y-axis, you have the likelihood of this kid becoming anxious or depressed. And from zero to 40 minutes a day, it's pretty flat. At 40 minutes a day, there is an inflection point and you start seeing a rise. An hour a day, you can see it's definitely significantly more risk than 40 minutes a day. Two hours a day, much higher risk. Why is that? Why that inflection point at 40 minutes a day? I've actually corresponded with Gene Twenge and others on this very question. And the answer the scholars give is that if a kid is on social media for 20, 30, 40 minutes a day, they're finding out what's going on with their friends. Look, kids don't send out invitations to parties anymore. They don't use voice to invite someone to a party or to hang with them. They do it on social media. So a teen on social media 20, 30, 40 minutes a day is often on social media 20, 30, 40 minutes a day uh, to find out what's going on and to respond to their invitations. Beyond 40 minutes a day, that teen is no longer using social media just to facilitate their social life. They are now producing. They are spending time creating and posting a video or other content on social media. And now they're looking to see how many likes do they get on their video? Uh, who's that person? What username? I don't recognize that username who didn't like my video and posted that nasty comment. Who could that be? Uh, that seems to explain why the inflection point. It's fine for your kid to be uh, using social media to facilitate their social life, but do not allow them to, to for social media to displace their social life, to become too invested in social media. So I think we can now be pretty confident that this limit of 40 minutes a day makes sense. And all of that, of the parental monitoring apps will warn your kid, uh, 10 minutes left for Instagram, five minutes left for Instagram. So you better check and make sure that you've seen all the most important messages, respond to those most important messages, because after time's up, you won't be able to log in for 24 hours. And I find many American parents who are skeptical. They'll be like, oh, come on. My kid is just going to Google, how do I get around parental, uh, parental controls on that nanny? Uh, well, I've actually done a great many 
presentations across uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, and I actually talked to some of the people who work at NetNanny, and they told me that NetNanny has employees whose full-time job is to Google the phrase, how do I get around parental controls on NetNanny? And every possible variation on that. On that. And if some kid has, has found a hole, they patch it, usually within hours in your app will update. These apps work. You must deploy one of these apps if your kids are gonna be on social media. So many girls are going to bed with their phone switched on. And at two in the morning, your daughter's getting a text. OMG, Jason and Vanessa just broke up. This is really big news. Parents are amazed to find that half the ninth grade class is awake and texting at two in the morning. Look, the rules of good parenting have not changed in 20 years. 20 years ago, a girl could not accept a phone call at two in the morning to exchange gossip because the phone would ring and the parents would not allow it because they knew it's more important for a kid to get a good night's sleep than to be up for an hour in the middle of the night exchanging gossip. That was true uh, 20 years ago. <laughs> and, and it's still true today. The only thing that's changed is the technology. It's now very easy for your daughter to accept that text because the phone never rang. She has her phone on vibrate mode and she's not talking, she's texting. But just because it's easy doesn't mean it should happen. This is your job. At nine o'clock at night, the very latest, you take your uh, phone, uh, you take your kid's device, you turn it off, and you put it in the charger, which from now on is going to be in the parents' bedroom, they can have it back tomorrow morning. Look, it is not reasonable to put the, ver the burden of this decision on your teenager. What is your 14-year-old daughter supposed to say tomorrow in school when her friend says, hey, I texted you last night at midnight, how come you didn't answer? Is your 14-year-old supposed to respond, well, researchers at Stanford have found that sleep deprivation in adolescence is a major risk factor in the etiology of anxiety and depression. Come on, it's ridiculous. Can't expect a kid to talk like that. You have to allow her to say, hey, my evil parents take my phone every night at nine. And then we'll say we have back till the next morning. It is your job to be the evil parent. At nine o'clock at night, the very latest, you take the device, you turn it off, you put it in the charger, which from now on is going to stay in the parent's bedroom. Your teen can have it back uh, tomorrow. No devices in the bedroom. That's not just my opinion. Those are the official guidelines of the American Academy of Pediatrics, which uh, state no unsupervised use of the internet. And the link to the full text of the AP guidelines are in your handout. Uh, there's more about this in, uh, I have a chapter on uh, girls and social media in my uh, book, Girls on the Edge, a uh, new edition shown there, comes out in four days. And if you're interested in this topic and digging deeper into the evidence, I hope you'll take a look at this book. Social media is more of a girl's issue as we've seen, but I now wanna turn to video games. So I wrote a book called Boys Adrift, the five factors driving the growing epidemic of unmotivated boys and underachieving young men. And during the pandemic, I think none of these factors is more important than video games. So researchers find that girls and boys tend to play different games and they tend to play them differently. Farmville was big for American girls a few years back. Uh, Farmville is not so big anymore, but uh, Candy Crush shown here is very big with American girls as is Homescapes. When you look and see who's spending more than two hours a week playing games like Candy Crush or Homescapes, you actually find that girls outnumber boys in those games. Most popular games for American teen boys right now are Minecraft, uh, the various iterations of Call of Duty, Grand Theft Auto. Fortnite is fading fat, fast, but it's still in the top five, along with RDR2. Average girl playing Candy Crush or Homescapes typically spends about 20 minutes in a session. Average boy playing a game like Call of Duty or Grand Theft Auto typically spends about two and a half hours in a session. So what's the relationship between time spent playing video games and how well you do in school? Well, researchers find that below a threshold of six hours a week, there is no relationship, but beyond that threshold of six hours a week, there is a linear and negative association. 
Average American boy now spends nine hours, more than nine hours a week playing video games compared to just about 90 minutes a week for the average girl. So these guidelines based in evidence are in your handout. No more than 40 minutes a night on school nights playing video games, no more than an hour a day on weekends and your minutes do not roll over. No screen time until all the chores are done and all the homework is done. And that again means no devices in the bedroom. Now, increasingly, I'm finding American boys who say things like, hey, but mom, video games are my job. Look, if I wanted to be a professional basketball player and I was spending hour to day, hours a day shooting baskets, you wouldn't have a problem with that. Well, I'm going to be a millionaire gamer. Uh, so, hey, I need, I need hours a day to become a, a top-notch gamer. So University of California, Irvine is one of about 170 uh, colleges nationwide that now offer scholarships or partial scholarships for gamers. And that number is rising very rapidly, the number of colleges offering uh, scholarships to gamers. So I actually spoke to the coach of the uh, video game team, interscholastic video game team at UC Irvine. And I, I talked to him, he, he and I are on absolutely the same wavelength. He knows all about what I call the video game death spiral. When I say the video game death spiral, I'm referring to that boy who's getting better and better at video games, but worse and worse at every other domain of his life, worse at school. His real life uh, friendships are dwindling and, and uh, uh, withering because he's spending all of his time in his bedroom looking at his video game screen until all he wants to do now is play video games. I call that the video game death spiral because the end result is often catastrophic, a suicidal depression. Well, coach, the coach knows all about this, and he, he has two full-time people on his, on his team, on his, uh, among his employees, two full-time employees whose job is to make sure that doesn't happen, to limit how much time his gamers are playing. And he has to sometimes meet with the gamer directly because the gamer says, hey, I'm going to play esports. That's my goal. That's my dream. That's my destination. And coach says, uh, no, that cannot be your destination because the odds are against you. Wildly against you. And even for that rare kid who does end up being a world champion gamer, that lasts Two years, three years tops, and then he's done. Gamers burn out very fast. So I actually wrote an article for the New York Times, and I'll, I, the link is in your handout, where I actually run the numbers. The odds that your son will be a champion player in the National Football League, those odds are much better than the odds that your son will make real money playing video games. And again, you'll find those odds and the sources for those odds in my article for the New York Times link is in your handout. No, you must limit how much time your, spent, your, your son is playing on video games. You don't want him to fall victim to the video game death spiral. And some games are worse than others. You must limit not only the amount of time your son spends playing video games, you must also limit which video games he plays. So researchers did a remarkable study where they followed more than 3,000 kids for three years' time. And measured changes in personality over those three years' time. So the way to conceptualize this study is you got two kids. They both spend 20 hours a week playing video games. Race, ethnicity, household income, religious affiliation, are identical for these two kids. Identical demographic parameters. The only difference is that one of these kids is playing violent games, like Grand Theft Auto, Call of Duty. The other kid is playing mostly sports games, like Madden NFL football, NBA basketball, FIFA soccer. Over three years, the personality of the boy playing the sports games does not change consistently in one direction or another. 
But the personality of the boys playing the violent games change. Boys playing violent games become more selfish, less honest, less patient. And the magnitude of that shift is pretty big. Not after a week or a month, but after three years. It's quite large. The worst games, games which change personality, the, push that change in personality from patient to impatient, from, from uh, altruistic to selfish, farthest and fastest, are games which employ what the researchers call a moral inversion. A moral inversion means that in the context of the game, good is bad and bad is good. So for example, in Grand Theft Auto, in order to accomplish your mission, you must acquire money and weapons. And you get the best weapons by killing police officers. So in the context of the game, it's a great idea to sneak up on some police officers and kill them. That's the only way you can get their weapons. You have to kill them. Now, in the real world, to sneak up on police officers and kill them just because they are police officers would be wrong and evil. But in the context of this game, it is a good and clever thing to do. If you get wounded in your firefight with the police officers in Grand Theft Auto, you can restore your health to 100% by having sex with a prostitute. But that will cost you money. You go up to her, you ask her how much she tells you, you give her that money, and then you have sex with her. You watch your avatar flopping on top of her. But that costs you money, and you need money in order to complete your mission. You don't have to do this, but it then makes good sense in the context of the game to stab her with your knife, and as she collapses to the ground and bleeds to death very realistically, you get your money back. That's the only way you can get your money back. You have to kill her. Now, in the real world, to kill a prostitute to get your money back would be insane and evil, but in the context of this game, it is a good and clever thing to do. And this is, right now, one of the most popular video games in the United States. And that's GTA V, which is seven years old. When GTA VI comes out next year, it will certainly be back in the number one position. It was in the number one position uh, some years back when lawmakers in California heard about this and they were horrified. They were like, are you kidding me? The most popular video game in the United States, Grand Theft Auto, is a game which has been shown to change personality over time, to cause kids to become less patient, less kind, less honest. They flew Anderson and Gentile to Sacramento and, then, and heard their testimony and they wrote a law. The California statute made it a civil offense to sell not just any games, but the worst games like Grand Theft Auto to minor child under 18 years of age. And the law, and it became a law. But the video game industry immediately brought suit, claiming that the California statute violated their First Amendment right of free speech. And the lawsuit went to the United States Supreme Court. And the United States Supreme Court ruled in favor of the video game industry and threw out the California statute, rendering it null and void. Justice Alito wrote a concurrence in which he said, look, I have read the research of Anderson and Gentile. And I share the concerns of California parents and California lawmakers. No child or teen should be playing these games. These games are heinous. That's the word he used. He said, nevertheless, it is the ruling of this court that deciding what games children or teenagers will play is not the job of the California State Assembly. It is the job of the parents. And I have included a link to the full text of Justice Alito's concurrence in your handout. Because you need to understand, this is your job. You must limit and govern what games your son is playing and how long he is playing them. When your son goes over to a friend's house, it's your job to call the friend's parents and say, hey, will there be a grown up around us to Make sure the kids aren't playing games like Grand Theft Auto. And if the parent says, hey, huh, they go in the bedroom, close the door, they got their headsets on, I'm not going to waste my time chaperoning what games my teenage son is playing. Then it is your job to say to your son, I'm sorry, 
You're not allowed to go to that boy's house. You must know what your son is doing. Fortunately, we now have a good website that has all the video games on it and gives good, unbiased, evidence-based guidance as to whether or not this game is okay. I've been talking mostly about teens, most popular game for teen boys. But something's happening right now I think you need to be aware of if you have a child age 12 and under. Most popular video game right now for children 9 to 12 years of age in the United States is Roblox. So five days ago, New York Times had a feature article on Roblox documenting that three quarters of American kids 9 to 12 years of age are now on Roblox. Players spent more than 3 billion hours, 3,000 million hours on the site in July, which is more than double what it was in February. Roblox has been a big winner in the pandemic. Kids spending more time online for kids 9 to 12 years of age, they're on Roblox. Well, you need to know about Roblox. Roblox is not, not really accurate to describe Roblox as a game. It is a game platform. It is a platform where you can create a game and it's very easy to create a game for other kids to play. And there are now more than 40 million games available for you to play on Roblox. More than 30,000 new games being uploaded to the Roblox platform every day. Far beyond the ability of any website to monitor with real people. So Common Sense Media can, cannot look at every one of those 40 million games. They can look at Roblox, and they did, and I'll show you what they concluded in just a moment. And the games are, those 40 million games are immensely diverse. You can solve puzzles, you can explore a castle, you can chat with strangers, you can adopt a pet, you can whack pigs with baseball bats, you can engage in simulated sex or in violent combat. Until recently, one of the most popular games was the Bloody Mary Challenge, shown here, which was like a horror movie where you get chopped to pieces or uh, if you're not lucky. Uh, that game has been removed because it was so violent and so distressing to these little kids. And I was at a school where the uh, elementary school principal told me that this second grader is having nightmares because he's playing the Bloody Mary Challenge and he, and he has nightmares of this uh, character, this blood spattered character coming to him, chasing him uh, in the middle of the night. Uh, Roblox has taken this game down. You can no longer play Bloody Mary Challenge, but there's still 40 million other games on the platform that you don't know about. This is a screenshot from the uh, Common Sense Media page on Roblox. Uh, you don't want your kid, your, your nine-year-old on Roblox. Uh, they recommend, Common Sense Media says, no kid under 14 should be on this platform. Uh, I personally think that you should use your parental monitoring app to block Roblox. Uh, you just don't know. Uh, of the 40 million games, what games your kid is playing, and you don't have the time to be looking over your kid's shoulder, and I'm not asking you to. There's plenty of good games out there, uh, sports games, homescapes, uh, Candy Crush. There's plenty of harmless games out there. Roblox is a black box. You don't know what you're getting with 40 million games on that platform. Again, the website is commonsensemedia.org. That's where you're going to go when you're, you, your son says, is it okay for me to play this game? And he should be asking you, and you should, and your parental monitoring app, of course, is going to show you what games he's playing. You don't need to play the game. Go to Common Sense Media. They'll tell you, and I have great confidence in their judgment. I have no affiliation with Common Sense Media. So as I said earlier, the first job of the parent is to teach virtue. But teaching virtue requires that you teach from a position of authority. If you're talking to your kid about not cheating on a test and you say, you know, I personally, I don't think I would cheat on tests because that's just not my thing. But, you know, you do you, whatever floats your boat. You're not teaching anything. 
I have been a medical doctor in the United States for 34 years. I have witnessed firsthand what I've come to call the collapse of American parenting. As recently as 20 years ago, it was common for an American parent to say, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It is now unusual to hear that. Over the last 20 years, that command, and it is a command, has softened, it has morphed into a question. And the question is often something like, well, you know, how would you feel if someone did that to you? And the parent has no idea what to say when their son answers, if someone did that to me, I'd kick him in the nuts and then I'd sit on his face. So Jennifer Finney Boylan, a regular columnist for the New York Times, wrote an article on enlightened parenting. And she asserts that enlightened parenting means setting your child free to discover for themselves their own right and wrong. And if in so doing, your child becomes a stranger to you, then so be it, quote, unquote. That may seem enlightened, but it is not enlightened. It is a dereliction of duty. You know, Osai spoke so movingly earlier about the shepherd. It's your job to be the shepherd. Imagine if the shepherd just said to the sheep, hey, Go your own way, whatever floats your boat. I'm going to look at my phone and play some Roblox. That's a delinquent shepherd. That is a derelict shepherd. That shepherd's not doing their job. If you set your kid free to discover for themselves their own right and wrong, you're not being a shepherd. You are derelict in your duty as a parent. If you set your kid free to discover for themselves their own right and wrong, and they live in the United States and they speak English and they have internet, what they're gonna discover is Grand Theft Auto, Call of Duty, Instagram, TikTok, Akon, Eminem, Bruno Mars, Miley Cyrus, Nicki Minaj, mainstream pornography. What is childhood for? A four-year-old horse is a mature adult. A four-year-old child has barely begun. And a horse is a bigger animal than a child. What's the point? A human is a child or adolescent for more years than most animals live. Why? We don't have to guess. We have scholars like Dr. Melvin Connor at Emory who have studied this question and for all of his career. And the answer he gives is that human childhood is as long as it is because it takes many years for the parents to teach the child what the child needs to know, right and wrong. That's a defining characteristic of our species. Jennifer Finney Boylan's recommendation to set your child loose is an abdication of parental responsibility, and it is profoundly unhuman. But I took this photo in Times Square. Live for now, Pepsi slogan. Whatever floats your boat. The real hazard of contemporary American culture, by which I mean the culture of Instagram, Billy Eilish, Bruno Mars, if it feels good, do it, whatever floats your boat. It deliberately undermines self-control and virtue. It prioritizes relations with same-age peers over the parent-child relation, and it disrespects parental authority. So what do you do about it? So I began this evening talking about how kids, American kids, researchers find, are no longer looking to grown-ups. The bonds across generations have been broken. You must restore those bonds across generations. And that starts with supper. No cell phones allowed at the dinner table. No screens at the dinner table. No TV on during supper. The benefits of supper, an evening meal with at least one parent are huge. So Frank Elgar and his colleagues interviewed more than 10,000 adolescents coast to coast and asked them in the last seven days, how many evening meals have you had at home with at least one parent? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven. And then for each of these 10,000 plus kids, they quantified internalizing problems like anxiety and depression, externalizing problems like hitting the wall and anger, positive well-being, pro-social behavior, and life satisfaction, and they found a huge effect at almost every step along the way, not just zero to seven, but every added meal per week. 
decreases internalizing problems like anxiety and depression, decreases externalizing problems, increases positive well-being, pro-social behavior, and life satisfaction. So that's what you have to do. You know, the pandemic has a silver lining. It has created more opportunities for more families to have meals together. Take advantage of that. And yet I know American families where the parents are saying, hey, my son is so miserable. I just figure, let him, let him binge. In fact, the New York Times had two articles in March and April in which they said, hey, don't worry about guidelines anymore. Just let your kid binge because it's a pandemic. What can you do? The New York Times. Don't do that. At dinner time, the devices are off. The family joins for a family meal around the dinner table. The benefits are huge. So my wife and I went to buy a new car. When the salesman found out we had a teenage daughter, he was very excited, wanted to sell us the rear seat entertainment system and handed us this flyer. Let's take a look at this flyer. The two kids have headphones on, looking at a screen. Mom is looking back at the kids, smiling as if to say, hey, this is great. We can drive to Dallas, never have to talk to my kids at all. Look, what are we thinking? Time is precious. We're all in a hurry. Time in the car is special. It's private time. No earbuds, no headsets in the car. When you're in the car, you should be listening to your daughter. And she should be listening to you, not to Cardi B or Miley Cyrus. Researchers studying middle class and affluent families in the United States have found recently that mother, father, mother, father, son, and daughter come home. And within five minutes, they are each in a different room looking at a different screen. You cannot have a family life if the family is not together. No screens in the bedroom. Nothing in the bedroom except a bed. You know, I hear from parents who say, hey, everything's online. My kids, everything she does, it's all online. And she doesn't finish her homework till, you know, 11 o'clock, midnight. I know it's important for kids to have a good night's sleep, but what can I do? I say, get the laptop out of the bedroom. Put it in the kitchen or the family room. The AAP guidelines say there should be no expectation of privacy. Kids should, all, kids should always expect a grown-up to be walking by. No expectation of privacy when a kid is on a device. And three weeks later, mom emails me and says, oh, my goodness. Homework's done by 9. She's in bed by 9.30. Her daughter wasn't lying. She didn't realize how much time she was spending on TikTok and Instagram. Get the device out of the bedroom, put the laptop in the kitchen or the living room. Homework's done by nine, she'll be in bed by 9.30. No devices in the bedroom. No TVs in the bedroom. You cannot have a family life if the family is not together. I want you to know I practice what I preach. My wife's parents live with us. There's our one big TV. That's my wife's parents sitting by the fireplace. My wife's on the couch. That's my daughter. Uh, we do a lot of uh, gardening. We grow our own cucumbers, squash, tomatoes. Uh, and there they are preparing that stuff. And uh, there is uh, the board game. That's my daughter winning at Parcheesi. And there's our group selfie. You know, American parents are confused. They think they have to choose between being the tiger mom pushing their kid to achieve or the iris setter dad who just lets their kid do whatever they want. But that is a false dichotomy. Last chapter of my book is titled The Meaning of Life. What I mean is that it's part of your job as a parent to impart to your kid your understanding of the big picture. Why are we here? What's it all about? And the answer better be something better than getting into UT Austin or making a lot of money because those answers will not satisfy. 
money does not buy happiness. That's not a sermon. That is a robust empirical finding. I'm a medical doctor. I can tell you about a lot of doctors who are earning a ton of money and they are miserable. You must teach your child your understanding of the meaning of life and it better be more than how much money you make. Because without that bigger context, working hard to get good grades is just a race to nowhere, to borrow the title of a documentary making that point. And the result is anxiety, depression, and disengagement. But you can't be the Irish center dad just letting kids do whatever they want if you have not first educated desire. Because researchers find when you let American teens do whatever they want, what American boys most want is video games, and what American girls most want is social media. You must teach your child a longing for things better, higher, deeper, more lasting than video games and social media. So four takeaways from this talk that I've listed in your handout. Prioritize the family over same age peers. Limit social media and video games as per the guidelines I've shared. Resist the temptation of safetyism. Don't teach your child to be fearful. Teach your child to have courage to take appropriate risks. Work with teachers and not against them. Teachers are your allies. So again, um, You'll learn more about all these topics in my books, Boys Adrift, Girls on the Edge, The Collapse of Parenting, Why Gender Matters, all of which are available on audiobooks. If you do a lot of driving, the, here's the audiobook uh, covers for the four books. Translations are available in these seven languages. The handout is online. It is 12 pages, it is online, it is case sensitive, it is all lowercase. And uh, it's my name, leonardsacks.com slash risala dot PDF. You must include the www and the dot PDF. Uh, my email is shown there. If you go to my website, you can sign up for a newsletter, which I hope you'll consider doing. Uh, but that's my talk. And uh, Rihan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, to moderate the questions. Okay, well, I'm going to step in for Rehan uh -huh. for a few more minutes before I um, pass it over to Hosai to actually moderate the questions. Um, before that, we have a few um, reflections from each of our sponsors. Thank you so much, Dr. Sachs. This was really informative and very um, helpful. I personally, um, don't have devices for my children. And then on the first day of school, I gave them the devices because everything's online. And I was talking to my sisters and I was like, why don't I do this more often? My house was quiet. My kids were in like far away. I had a few minutes of breathing space, which, you know, over the summer, it's been, it's, it's been rough, but this has, um, this talk has just, um, re, um, re um, affirmed my my belief that taking the hard way of not having the devices is better for them in the long run. Um, yeah. I, I want to just add, you have highlighted the great temptation that we as parents face. You know, we're busy. we got to get stuff done. And it's very tempting. Give your kid a device or a screen or an iPad. Hey, Go away for an quiet. Hour to get some stuff done. Yes. Don't give in to that temptation. Your child is your first priority. I know it's a temptation. I'm a working father. You know, I got to get stuff done, but uh, don't give in to that temptation that you have just uh, so ably described. Thank you. Um, so our first uh, reflection is going to be from Ruhi Yunus, who is a board member of one of our one of our co-sponsors, Muhammad Webb Foundation. She is also the co-founder of R and R Strategies. Ruhi, are you with us to give a one-minute reflection? Ruhi. Oh, okay. Let me find you so I can unmute. Unmute. She's Sorry. muted. Um, gosh. She should be able to unmute herself. Yeah, you should be. I didn't mute anyone. Let's see. 
Assalamualaikum, Mababa. Thank you. Oh, wa alaikum as -salam. Yeah, sorry, I wasn't able to unmute myself. So some Zoom magic happening. <laughs> Not a problem. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Sachs, uh, for sharing such vital information for us in this time about how to um, be stronger um, parents that are supported by data and facts um, that support, um, you know, what was probably intuitive to a lot of parents on, on this conversation. Um, so I am from the Mohammed Webb Foundation. We're based in the Western suburbs of Chicago, and we are a family-led initiative that has both multi-ethnic and multi-religious families. Um, we also have families that are non-nuclear. Um, there may be a single parent that is raising their children or in a co-parenting relationship. Uh, we also have families that have a lot of elders in the home. So there's a lot of intergenerational um, challenges and also strengths that our families have. Um, our, fo our focus, um, what Dr. Sachs ended on, is about the meaning of life. And really, our, our focus is on the core family structure and our um, outlook or our social impact is if you can have a strong core family and create a positive culture around it, then those family members and those children then can contribute positively to the society at large. Um, so very much of everything that Dr. Sachs has said has really resonated with myself and members of our community. So one of the concerns that I've been hearing among parents um, that the, is that the pandemic is resulting in major, major trauma um, or um, in, uh, as you have mentioned, anxiety for our kids. And since everyone is experiencing this problem and they feel that this trauma is going to um, kind of stay, remain with them, um, how can we reframe this current situation at the, at, of the pandemic for our children and for ourselves so it actually helps develop resilience rather than um, this expectation that it will be a negative outcome mm -hmm. for sure. a negative trauma. So as you know, I began this evening by sharing data that indeed there has been an explosion in anxiety and depression among uh, young Americans. Other research from Dean Twenge and other, uh, others have shown it's even worse among adolescents where now in, in some surveys, more than 50% of American adolescents are now significantly impaired due to anxiety and or depression. Um, so uh, yeah, certainly that's trauma, but why is that? As I said, kids are facing uncertainty and they're only looking to other peers. They're in this co-rumination, uh, positive feedback death spiral, uh, we can turn this to good if we can take advantage of this social isolation. There's no social isolation between a parent and a child. So we can take advantage of this time to strengthen bonds or if necessary, restore bonds between the parent and the child. And there is no guidance from the CDC or any state that I am aware of that is saying parents can't go for walks with their kids. You can go for walks with your kids. You can play games with your kids. You can uh, watch a movie with your kid. Uh, you can play a board game with your kid. Uh, there's so many things you can do with your kid. I, I uh, have a chapter in my book, The Collapse of Parenting, titled Enjoy, where I remind parents, you've got to do fun stuff with your kids. And I will warn you, if you have a teenager and your teenager is a typical American teenager, they don't want to do fun stuff with you. In, in their perspective, that is so lame. Like, I don't even want to be, that teenager will say, I don't want to be seen dead with, with my parent outside because that's so uncool. For the typical American teen to be seen hiking uh, or doing something fun with a parent and not with the same age peer, that's really uncool. Well, you may have to compel your kid to do that. And they may, uh, they may be, uh, they may say, no, 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 nowhere in Houston. All right, well, we'll drive to Galveston uh, and we'll walk, uh, we'll walk along, uh, I'm forgetting what they call it, the river walk is in San Antonio. That, that, that lovely walk they have by the, 
water there in, in Galveston. Um, we just go for a walk. Uh, that's allowed. Um, make your kid do fun stuff with you. It's not easy. And the older your kid, the more challenging it will be if they have not been uh, accustomed to doing it. But that's my short answer. There's nothing inevitable. Look, again, you need to give your kid a grown-up perspective. For many middle-income and affluent uh, American kids, this is the first time that the world has said no to them, that they can't do what they want. And it's traumatic. Oh, come on, give me a break. They're not dying of hunger. They are not dying of cancer. I have attended children dying of cancer. That's trauma. The coronavirus for the typical child or teen is not, it's an inconvenience. It is not death. It is not life-threatening. Um, and But they're all anxious and depressed. The majority of American children and teens are now anxious and depressed, Gene Twangy tells us. That's because we haven't been doing our job. We have been allowing them to find their primary attachment with same age peers. And then when that is disrupted, their world is upside down and they perceive it as very traumatic. We need to reorient them. We need to give them a different perspective, different experience, and we need to restore the parent-child bond as the preeminent uh, attachment in your child's life. Thank you so much. We have one more reflection from our second co-sponsor, Elm Academy. Um, we have a parent, um, Nabila Ansari, who has five beautiful children, four of whom are students at Elm Academy. I am looking to unmute you. Nabila, are you here? I am, and I'm not on video, sorry. <laughs> awesome, not a problem. Uh, Dr. Sachs, thank you so much for your extremely insightful presentation. Um, I attended your last presentation here in Houston about two years ago, and that was equally as insightful as well. Um, I wanted to say I found your discussion of social media and self-control and video games and self-control uh, very, very interesting. Uh, because in Islam and in all the other major religions um, as well, I believe, the exercise of self-control is crucial uh, to attaining some sort or some degree of quote unquote uh, spiritual success. Um, so I just wanted to kind of throw this out there for the parents who are um, looking for some insight in how to deal with children and controlling their video time, their screen time, um, in order to make them understand, um, you know, that they have to have self-control, we have to first explain to parents, as parents to them, uh, why it's important to have self-control, what are the dangers, or um, how can too much screen time manifest itself on you as a child negatively, so that they can finally come to understand why they need to have self-control. Um, so that's just, you know, my two cents <laughs> in dealing with a 14-year-old boy who loves video games and um, an 11-year-old girl who's, uh, probably going to be into social media very soon. Can I just uh, jump in there? Because uh, I, I agree with that so strongly. I actually devote two chapters of my book, The Collapse of Parenting, to reviewing many different longitudinal cohort studies in which they follow kids from childhood through adolescence right into their 30s. So these studies take 35, 40 years to complete. And what every one of these studies has found they ask the question, what characteristic of a child or teenager best predicts health, wealth, and happiness 20, 30 years down the road when this person is now in their 30s? Every one of these studies finds that self-control, self-control predicts health, wealth, and happiness. Grades and test scores are not powerful predictors of health, wealth, and happiness 20 years down the road, but self-control is. So it follows that one of your first jobs as a parent is to teach your kid 
self-control. How do you teach self-control? It's very simple. You say no dessert until you eat your vegetables. No games until the chores are done and the homework is done. And if that hasn't been the rule, it's it's and you announce that rule, you're going to get an explosion. But if both parents stand their ground, if both parents stand their ground, after six weeks, you will have a child with better self-control and in the great majority of cases, a happier child as well. Thank you so much. I am going to pass it on over to Ustaz Husay to, um, to, to facilitate the rest of the question answer, but we do want this to be interactive. So if you are on here, we would love for you to turn on your video so we can see you and interact with you. Thank you so much. I see some people already turning them on. Um, and with that, I will mute myself and Ustad Husay, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lubaba. And thank you to all of the previous questioners. Your questions were amazing. And of course, thank you to Dr. Sachs for what a phenomenal presentation. And the fact that you gave us this PDF is just so uh, indicative of your generosity. A lot of people are very, you know, they don't give their content so freely, but thank you so much because it was so helpful to follow along with everything. And then we get to go back and sh look it over. So really tremendous presentation. Uh, I learned so much. Thank you. But, uh, thank you. Um, we have quite a few questions here popping up in the Q&A. And I do want to re uh, restate or reiterate what uh, Lubaba just said, which is if you would like to come on the mic and also submit a uh, question in person, we invite you to do that. But in the meantime, I do have a list of questions that have come through. So the first one I thought was really um, a powerful question because many people will likely relate to this. And in my experience, I've heard the same. How do we restore the parent-child bond when parents are also depleted? They themselves have nothing to give. So how do you give to your child when you yourself feel like you're just drained and, and you're exhausted? Well, sure. And, and there are other variations on that as I'm looking through the chat. Um, I've, uh, one one uh, parent said, um, what about if dad is playing video games? Uh, and, I, and I tie that into your question, the other question that you just posed. To become a better parent, you must become a better person. Mm. Cannot teach a child a virtue which you yourself do not possess. If you feel like, hey, I'm, I'm tired, I'm just going to blow up the whole parent thing and you go look at your screen for a couple hours because I need to chill. You're, you're sending a, a message to your kid. Your kid needs to see that even though you're tired, you will be there for your child and you will prioritize your child. And it is tough because this is unprecedented and we are all trying to juggle things we've never had to juggle before. Uh, whether that be financial worries or trying to work from home with a kid who's at home, uh, these are new challenges and I am not minimizing them. But you and I are parents and you and I must always keep in mind that our parent, our child is our first priority. And you need to sit down and have an honest talk with your kid. Uh, and the older the child, the easier it is to do this and to say, look, I have to participate in this Zoom meeting with my, with my boss and I'm not gonna be able to talk to you or play with you for the next hour. You need to entertain yourself, but not with a screen. You're not asking too much. I know other parents who are doing this. Uh, and I remind you that you didn't have social media or this quality video games when you were growing up. In my generation, we had Pong and Pac-Man, uh, which we didn't play because they were stupid. Uh, uh, most of us grew up without social media. Really, all of us grew up with, grew up without social media, and most of us grew up without playing video games. It is not asking too much to ask your child to read a book or your young child to uh, play with building blocks, Legos, 
or dolls, uh, something that doesn't have a screen. It is not asking too much. Now, I live in the United States. So I am well aware that your child will likely say, but neighbor kid gets to play all they want. Look, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell you a little secret. The original title of my book was not The Collapse of Parenting. The original title of my book was The Collapse of American Parenting. And the subtitle was Why Most Kids Would Now Be Better Off Raised Outside the United States. And some of you mentioned you've heard me speak before, and I guarantee you uh, that you heard me previously share uh, how kids raised outside the United States are doing better than kids raised in the United States. They are much, much less likely to be anxious or depressed than kids raised in the United States. That kids whose parents were born and raised outside the United States are likely to do better than kids whose parents were born and raised in this country, especially if they speak their, their native language at home. If you were born outside the United States and you are fluent in a language that is not English, speak that language at home and make sure your kids are fluent in that language at home. Because we now have very good research showing that that protects your kid. If your kid only speaks English and is immersed in American English speaking culture, that's a major risk factor for bad things happening. So yeah, I get it. This is a tough time. We're all being stretched and challenged in ways to which we are not accustomed. You have to dig deeper to become a better parent. You have to become a better person and it is not easy. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Saxon. You know, also from your books, what I've gotten too is that we have to remember when you're, you know, bringing your family together and, pri you know, prioritizing family time, there's a mutual benefit, right? That you are providing that safe space for your children and being there for them, but they'll also be there for you. So everybody just starts to work together. So if you feel that you're carrying a lot of weight, doing all the chores, especially I'm talking to a lot of the moms, because I know working with so many women, women tend to be doing a lot within the house or working outside. And so they feel really run down because they don't have enough support. But once you start to work on bringing your family together and pri prioritizing family time, you'll see that your kids want to help you. They want to be involved. And so they're going to carry some of that burden away instead of you feeling like you have to. And I'm just speaking specifically to the Muslim community because I do feel like it's part of our psyche where you know, the perfect mom or super mom, we kind of get in this mindset where we have to do it all. In some of our cultures, that's how we were raised, that you should be able to cook a full course meal and have the house spotless and, you know, have the toys put away and the kids are perfect and, you know, looking polished. Like it's a lot of pressure on women in our culture. So I feel though, once you start to, again, work on that relationship based on all of Dr. Sachs's amazing advice, that you'll see the residual benefits of that. Um, that they'll start to help you out. So, okay, great. So many uh, amazing questions. A lot of them do have to do with your advice on social media and monitoring and sort of, you know, putting limitations and boundaries. I think uh, some people are, you know, they're asking very specific questions, but in general, if you can, I know you covered it in the presentation, but in terms of, you know, some people are asking, for example, for girls, what is your advice about WhatsApp messages or sending, you know, text messages to their friends? Should there be a limitation on that type of social media um, behavior as well as, you know, Instagram or, or Snapchat? Um, others are asking about video games. Are there alternative options, uh, you know, to, um, for example, you know, are certain video games acceptable like PS4 yes. where it's not so violent? So do you have some maybe general guidelines on, on that? Yeah. Let, let me answer that. Uh, again, I did not uh, advise a ban on video games. I did not advise a ban on social media. I'm, I'm reading some of these chats where people seem to, I think I've said that uh, at least two parents said, why shouldn't we ban all social media or, and or all video games? Look, I know parents who've done that and they're doing fine. In fact, every parent I can think of that I know in my own practice or that I've talked with at length around the United States who have banned social media and banned video games, those parents are glad they did it. And I'm not telling them not to, uh, but I try to make my recommendations evidence-based. And the evidence we have shows that kids who are playing video games in moderation, less than 40 minutes a day, 
kids who are using social media in moderation, less than 40 minutes a day, do not seem to be harmed by that. And in view of that finding, I do not think the evidence supports a ban. I also know from firsthand experience with uh, patients and parents who I know well, that trying to institute such a ban requires a very courageous parent because your kid will say to you, nobody else is doing this. And your kid's probably right. Uh, so you're gonna have to have exceptional courage to institute such a ban. I've also seen in the chat some parents who are skeptical of the parental monitoring apps and say, oh, my kid's just going to find a way around this. Mm -hmm. The apps really work. These are professionals. They know about vault apps. They know about hidden apps, apps that don't show up on the screen that will not show up under apps recently installed. They know about this. This is what they do. They're professionals and these apps will work. There is one situation where you installing an app on your kid's phone won't work. And that is when your kid has another phone you don't know about. Mm -hmm. We are finding that in affluent households, and I have spoken in River Oaks and uh, West Jew and, and to these affluent parents where uncle is giving his teenage nephew $300 as a 15th birthday present, don't ever do that. Don't ever give a teenager a lot of cash for which they are not accountable. Because if you've got $100, you can go to Best Buy and get a burner phone, which is what kids call phones that are untraceable. Parents don't even know the kid has this phone and he's just paying for his own data, uh, cash money, and parents don't even know that phone is there. Uh, so you need to know whether your kid has additional devices. Again, your router can do this. I talk a little bit about routers in your handout. Your routers can show you what phones are active. Uh, and uh, they're even more sophisticated device. If your kid is not going through the router, you can find them. Uh, but you've got to make sure you know what devices your kid is using and you must install parental monitoring software on these apps uh, and others and, and Ruhi have said, hey, we're doing all this and we're still exhausted. I get that too. Um, I, look, I'm an American born and raised in this country. One of my favorite actors was Clint Eastwood and he's got a great line in, in one of his movies, one of the Dirty Harry movies, he says, a man's got to know his limitations. A man's got to know his limitations. And I think that's right. We all have to know our limitations, but that's not an excuse for giving your kid an iPad and saying, go off and amuse yourself. You may have to share with your kid that I'm done. I'm tired. I can't do anymore. It's okay to share that with your kid. And your kid, especially an older kid, a tween or teen, you can say, I can't do that right now. Now, your two-year-old's not going to understand that, but your 12-year-old can. That, hey, let's just, let's just be together. And, okay, you really want to watch some TV? You know what? Thank you. And we'll watch TV together. I am proud to tell you that my daughter can sing you every song from My Fair Lady, from Singing in the Rain, uh, from uh, An American in Paris. There's lots of, of good, healthy American English language entertainment out there. And if you have that great advantage that you are fluent in Gujarati or Urdu, that's great, because then you can pull up that culture and you can watch those shows together. Uh, almost any culture is healthier right now than American English speaking culture. And I can talk on that at great length. And I know a lot about uh, Mexico. I have spoken on this topic on multiple occasions in Mexico City, in uh, uh, Guadalajara, Clacapaque, San Luis Potosí, Monterrey, uh, 
I recognize the shortcomings of Mexican Spanish culture, but it is nothing like American culture. It is a much healthier culture where family is still celebrated rather than being ignored or disrespected as is now typical of contemporary American culture. So yeah, I get it. We're all stressed. You can't always be the model parent. It's okay to veg on the couch with your kid and watch a movie. Just do it together. Do it together. Even if that means uh, watching Sesame Street with your four-year-old. One TV you watch together with your kid. Thank you so much, Dr. Sachs. Uh, that was amazing. I think, um, again, so many of the questions overlap, but you, you were able to answer so many that we received. I do want to invite uh, Sister Nafis, if you're there, to please come on the mic. Um, you've had your hand raised and I appreciate your patience. So if you, um, let me go ahead and unmute you and hopefully that should work. Um, I'm trying to unmute you. It's not, okay, there we go. So you should be able to now. Oh speak. yes, I, I can, I'm, I'm unmuted. Thank okay. you, assalamu alaikum. Hi, Dr. Sachs. Hi. Um, I, I, what a wonderful presentation, it's very enlightening. I, I've read many of your books. And so um, I did want to piggyback off of somebody who asked this question uh, previously. It was about, um, like, I, I think it was something about my, uh, her son is maybe 14 or something, and now my daughter's getting, in every, I don't know if she said, I, I don't know what word she used, but something about she's going to get into social media, right? Um, uh, that a lot of parents that I speak with, sometimes they're a little, I think, afraid to put those boundaries. Like, why does our, why do our daughters have to be on social media? Why, just because their friends are, right? And so how do you look, how do you deal with the teenage side of it? I, as a parent can say, you're not playing video games anymore. Um, it's not good for you, whatever. How do you, what do you do with the child then? They are, they're gonna throw your, their tantrums, they're gonna whatever. So what, how do you deal with that? Okay, so there's a couple aspects to your question. Uh, but what I really hear you saying is when you try to set limits, kids will push back. And the older the child, the, the harder and longer the pushback will be. <clears throat> so if your daughter is 14 or 15 or 16 and she's been on social media, say, well, we're going to start setting limits. Uh, it is very likely that your daughter will, pu will push back. I've heard of many parents tell me their daughter says, I hate you. I hate you. You're going to like totally ruin my whole life. Uh, I never want to talk to you ever again. Uh, both parents must stand their ground. That will pass. Not in a day, not in a week, but in six weeks, your daughter will be talking to you again and you have stood your ground and contrary to what she thinks her friends will not ostracize her they will just say well you know her she's got the weird parents who don't let her spend a lot of time on social media they're fine with it uh, that has been my experience with many many parents who've who have uh, set these limits. Look, that's your job as a parent to set limits. It is not reasonable to expect a 14 year old to set their own limits. That's why they have parents. But if, if you like many American parents say, Hey, you know, I'm going to trust her to to you know, she's 14 years old. Um, look, that's immensely unfair to your kid because she is immersed in a toxic American culture where uh, most of the kids, their parents are not setting limits. And again, as I said earlier, is your 14 year old supposed to say to her friends, well, researchers have found that uh, spending all your time on social media um, increases the risk of anxiety and depression and undermines the ability to achieve in other domains. Come on, you can't expect a kid to talk that way. You have to allow your 14 or 15 or 16 year old to say, 
I would like to spend all my time on social media, but my parents won't allow it. You must set limits. That's your job as a parent. I know it's not easy, but you must do it. And you will, may have to take drastic steps. And by drastic, I mean you may need to move to a different city. Because I have found parents who say, my kids, all of my kids' friends are doing this. And I don't know any way to change her unless we get a different group of friends. And I don't know how to do that. Well, you might have to move. And, and I wanted you to know that I'm not asking you to do something my wife and I did not do. You might be wondering, how does such an old guy as Dr. Sachs have a 14-year-old daughter? Well, my wife and I thought we were infertile. And uh, we didn't have uh, our child until we were much older than most new parents. And that's how we have a 14-year-old daughter. But when, we, when she came along, when she was born, we realized we need to find a better school. And we were, we were living in a small town in, in rural Maryland that didn't have a school that we considered top quality. And so we moved. I sold my practice and we moved from Montgomery County, Maryland to Chester County, Pennsylvania, uh, about three, four hours drive. Um, because if you're a parent, your first priority is your kid and you do what you have to do. Uh, and and uh, again, if your kid is, is immersed in a toxic group of peers, you may need to change that peer group. Uh, and if that means moving to, from, from, to a different part of town or even to a different city altogether, then that's what you have to do. Thank you, Dr. Sachs. That, that concept is certainly not foreign to a lot of Muslims. We do have a concept called hijra, which is you know, moving exactly from one place to another for the sake of one's family or safety or for the sake of preserving one's faith. So it's definitely something that we understand, but the fact that you've uh, you know, shared your own private journey with us is, is amazing for us to see that it's possible and you've clearly benefited from doing that. I've actually also spoken to people who've had to do the same and they, they're very grateful that they, uh, that, that, that they were able to intervene at a, at, at a time to protect their children. And so they're happy. Um, now, uh, again, there's so many questions coming, but I did want to just ask um, a question that may uh, in, in a way address a lot of the ones that, that are still coming through. Um, one of the things that I would love to hear from you is, is about the effect of on the brain itself, because as a physician, you would know better, but sometimes people aren't quite, um, they don't quite understand that these are highly addictive and they actually have the ability to rewire the brain when you are giving your child and you're getting them on that you know, dopamine kick or the serotonin kick that they're getting every time they get a like and, a, and or on these video games, that you're actually promoting in a way or, or, or uh, affecting their, their mental health in that way. Unbeknownstly, obviously no, no, uh, no parent would do that intentionally, but that is one of the uh, you know, ramifications of allowing uh, not, or not regulating and not uh, setting limitations is that your children are, it's almost like it's a, you know, it's a vicious cycle. It just keeps repeating. They don't, they don't have the control, right? They're, they're, prefrontal cortex isn't uh, fully developed. So they don't have the ability to control themselves. And then that addiction takes over. So it's almost like, it's just, it's going to continue to spiral unless and until you become the bad cop, right? Or the, the bad parent, quote unquote, where you have to just intervene and say enough is enough. And that I think is also another part of this question, which is how do does a parent um, you know, really stop this uh, or, or uh, reject the notion that I have to befriend my children and befriend my teens, because if I'm not that cool, relevant parent that, you know, gets their jokes and references and I'm not in their world, then they will leave me altogether and, you know, I'll just never see them again. So I think that fear is also what drives a lot of parents to indulge their children, to give in and to, okay, fine, you can have this, you can have that. But, you know, as you've just stated, you you have to set those boundaries and they'll be fine. But I think driving that point about there needs to be a clear you know, a distinction between a parent and a friend and, and trying to, yeah. uh, to, to, to blur those lines is all, probably why we are where we are today. Yeah, I want to pick up on that. I'm going to have to sign off in about five minutes, but I do want to pick up on your excellent point. 
many American parents actually think it's their job to be their kid's best friend. That's a big mistake and that's not accurate. Look, a friend is a peer and a friend cannot command you. A friend cannot say, I will not allow you to pig out on ice cream right before supper. Only a parent can do that. A friend cannot say, hey, I'm turning off your device and taking it from you because you need to get a good night's sleep. A friend cannot say that. Only a parent can say that. There's any number of kids out there who can be your kid's best friend, but none of those kids can do the job of the parent, which is your job. That doesn't mean that you're always the, the mean guy. On the contrary, most of your interactions with your kid should be fun and friendly interactions. And I talk about that again in that chapter titled Enjoy, that you need to make time to do fun stuff with your kids. Because if your interactions with your kids are mostly negative and disciplinary, you will not be effective. Uh, but you still are the parent. So uh, I'm a medical doctor, as you know, and on a few occasions in my career, I have been summoned in connection with a girl who was a victim of sexual assault. And I vividly remember when I was attending physician at Shady Grove Adventist Hospital, I got a call in the middle of the night, literally, from the ER about a patient well known to me, a teenage girl who was indeed in the ER. She'd been a victim of sexual assault, but they didn't want me to be the attending physician or a consultant. Mom, the girl's mom, had asked the ER staff to call me. She wanted me to be there she wanted me to uh, advise her and, and, and be there for her. So I came into Shady Grove Adventist Hospital, middle of the night, and went into the room where mom was. The girl was still being uh, assessed in the ER. Uh, and mom and I were in the consultation room alone. And it, when I walked in the room, the first thing mom said, she said, I knew I shouldn't have let her go. It was a frat party at the college. She's mm -hmm years old. I knew I shouldn't have let her go. And of course, you want to grab mom and say, well, then why'd you let her go? But I didn't say that because I knew the answer. The answer was she wanted to be your daughter's best friend. And a best friend doesn't say no. Much better example of good parenting come from a mom I spoke with in Tampa, Florida, when I was speaking in a school there. And this uh, mom told me how her 14-year-old daughter came to her and said, hey, guess what? We're all going to Cancun for spring break. And mom looked at her phone and she said, well, I can't get away that week, I'm busy. This was years ago. And her daughter said, I didn't say you're going to Cancun for spring break. I said, we're going to Cancun for spring break, me and all the girls. And mom said, you're going to Cancun, Mexico for spring break? You're with no grownups? You know, you're 14 years old. I don't think it's safe. And she told me, her daughter said, oh, it's totally safe. We'll be fine. We'll have our phones. We'll stay together. It's totally fine. And mom said, I'm sorry, you're not going. And she told me her daughter exploded and started screaming at her. I totally hate you. You're going to totally ruin my life. And mom said she responded to her daughter. She said, well, to be perfectly honest, sometimes I'm not so fond of you either. She said, but I'm your mother. That's a job. Item one in my job description is I have to keep you safe. And I know more than you do about the behavior of drunk young men. And you're going. If you're doing your job as a parent, there will be times when you must say to your son or daughter, I'm sorry, you're not going. I won't allow it. Not that website, not that video game. And your child may be angry at you and may raise their voice and may say hurtful things. It's part of your job. Someday, maybe a month from now, maybe a year from now, maybe 10 years from now, your child will say, you know what? I'm so grateful to you. Mm -hmm. I, must, I must very quickly tell you one story very quickly before I have to sign up. Um, so another uh, young woman that I spoke with in, and interviewed on multiple occasions in preparing my book, her name, first name is Marlo. She was raised by what she considered very strict parents. And she was not allowed to go out on dates without a chaperone. And she was not allowed to go to, go to see any movie that was rated R, only G and PG. She was not allowed to be alone with a boy ever. 
And she was furious, she told me. She said to her parents, this is child abuse. I'm going to call Child Protective Services. And her mom handed her the phone and said, there, go ahead. And she said, I'm going to have to be in therapy for like the rest of my life because of the way you are abusing me. And this went on for years. She said high school years were very tense because her parents were always saying no, and none of the other parents were like that. And then she went to university. She went to the University of Virginia, Charlottesville. And she told me she had this sudden blinding insight. In her second year at UVA, she realized, oh my goodness, I'm the only girl here who's not going to have to be in therapy for the rest of my life because of the way my parents raised me. She said, all these other girls at UVA are saying, hey, do you think this photo is too skanky or not skanky enough? Do you think I'm giving oral sex to too many guys or not enough guys? And she wants to shake these girls and say, get a grip, get a life. Don't you have your own life that isn't about what the boys think or how you look on Instagram? And she says she is now so grateful to her parents at 20 years of age, but she sure didn't feel like that at 16 years of age. So again, one thing I'm trying to accomplish in my books is to empower parents to do what you know is right. Have the courage not to be a typical American parent. Set limits, teach virtue, do the right thing. Listen, I got to go because I promised my daughter I would read to her at 20 minutes past the hour. So Thank I'm going to sign so off. Much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sykes. That was amazing. very much this opportunity. Thank you again. Thank and you. Thank you for your time. Bye-bye. Good, good night. Wow. That was amazing. There's so many thoughts swirling through my head, but I think uh, for myself, I'm sure, and all of the other sisters on the call, we can relate to, to, to that story very much. We weren't allowed to do much when I was younger either. No, no sleepovers, no nothing really. Everything was at our house and that's it. A lot of limitations, but same, uh, same response later on in life. You appreciate those things. So alhamdulillah, um, I think we're uh, going to close out the event unless there's any final thoughts. I'll turn it over to the organizers, um, but I'm here. If anybody has any questions for me, I'm happy to answer those questions, um, but I'll turn it over. Maybe Sister Lubaba or Brother Rehan. Okay. Jazakallah khair. We have about another maybe seven, eight minutes. Um, I do have a few announcements that I'll make right now and then maybe we can close off with one or two more questions. Um, again, we'd like to thank our guests for tonight, Dr. Leonard Sachs and Ustada Hussain Mujaddidi. Jazakumullah khair um, for your insight and for your experience in sharing that with us. Um, and we would like to also thank our gracious hosts, Ilm Academy and Muhammad Webb Foundation. Uh, please visit Risala's webpage for further details on future events. We have two coming up. One is on Saturday, September 19th with Dr. Craig Considine and Dr. Jonathan Brown will be joining us virtually for an, for an event titled The Humanity of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then we are also excited to host our first ever virtual concert titled Awakenings with Ali Sati Farah Siraj, Mas'ud Curtis and Omar Effendim on Saturday, November 4th, 14th, sorry, Saturday, November 14th. Um, your the Facebook page, I believe they've already put it in the links as well as links to all of the rest of um, the resources. Um, I just had one uh, question comment, and I think I want to address it to you, Sister Ustada Hosai, um, and that's the concept of what is our what is the goal? What is that? Um, that big picture that we're supposed to be instilling in our children and how do we instill it in them? I know as a 